So I'm going to talk about custom maps through OpenStreetMap. Um, first, I'm just going to give a little background of how I got into OpenStreetMap. So about four years ago, um, I lived in this neighborhood outside of Washington, D.C. It's just a typical American suburban neighborhood. And um, I started mapping it primarily because it had a bad reputation um, as uh, just not being nice, a lot of graffiti and things like that. But it also had 30 miles of hiking trails, so I started mapping that. So this is just sort of a spare time hobby thing. I'd go out with my dogs and, and map. So fast forward to 2010 and, well, and then all the way to today. Uh, I work for the Humanitarian Open Street Map team in Indonesia. Um, and what we do is we use open source software and open data through OpenStreetMap for disaster response and disaster planning. Um, side note about the picture. Uh, since this picture was taken, that uh, plane has caught fire. It did not crash. And I've unfortunately flown on it since um, because we didn't know it had been on fire. Anyway, OpenStreetMap. Uh, this is the typical image we use to describe it. So as with Wikipedia, how anyone can edit and add information to encyclopedia articles, OpenStreetMap, anyone could add information to the map, typically using a GPS or satellite imagery or sometimes data from other sources. So we are fast uh, approaching a million registered users and thousands of people edit on a daily basis. We also, with people adding information in, there's also consumers of the data. Here's just a couple of the bigger ones. Uh, recently, Foursquare, for example, switched to using OpenStreetMap on their website. Uh, one of the primary reasons for this is Google's Ma Google Maps API used to be free, and now they started charging for it, and so switching to OpenStreetMap was cheaper for them. Um, the White House uh, in the U.S. also uses OpenStreetMap in uh, one of their web applications. Flickr has been using it for a long time. I know most of you are like MapQuest, but they, uh, they actually have an open program where they use OpenStreetMap and provide a robust API you can use for routing and uh, showing maps. I'm going to do just a quick legalese thing. Um, so it's openly licensed under the Open Data Commons Open Database License. It's basically like CC by SA, but it's appropriate for data since data is not a creative work. Summary, copyright is complicated. If you do want to discuss it later, I actually spend a lot of time talking about licenses, so that's okay, but you, the rest of you probably don't want to listen to it in this presentation. Okay, so this whole data thing. Um, how does this free map of the entire world work? So for starters, you need to have shapes. Um, so we have this idea of nodes, ways, or closed ways. Closed way is just a line that intersects with itself. And so you can map pretty much anything with these three uh, primitives. Uh, you know, a point of interest, a store, a building, a road. And people do map all of those things in OpenStreetMap. And then we have this little bit odder idea, which is called a relation. So that is saying something about another object or series of objects. Since you guys are uh, all developers, which is actually not the audience I regularly talk to, maybe this isn't quite your reaction, but I'm going to explain a little further. So. Uh, for example, let's say you mapped uh, this road and this bus stop. Well, let's say they're part of the same route. You would use a relation to describe that. So it's basically a collection. Um, another example is, let's say you have two islands, and let's say they're in the same state or province. Um, so you have that primitive uh, outline of the island that says it's an island, the name of it, things like that. But then you can also combine it to say something broader. So we drew a bunch of shapes, but that doesn't really say much. If you have a point and don't say that it's a shop, it's not really that useful. Um, so with the flexibility of the data model, you can describe a point as a school, or in this case, a polygon. It all depends on the level of detail of information 
you have. So let's run through a quick scenario. So when you're looking at things from space, you can't tell as much about them. Um, so this is a, uh, this example is a small structure. It's kind of difficult to tell. You can tell something's there. Um, you might just say, okay, it's a building. But let's say you go there, and then you can see, okay, it's actually a uh, small uh, aluminum structure. This is technically an airline fuselage that's been turned on its side, um, and a restaurant. So uh, you can tell quite a bit more information about it. This actually happens to be a restaurant and a tourist attraction um, in the, one of the small towns outside of Washington, D.C. So I gave you a basic breakdown of data, open street map. Um, not asking you to try this now, but you know, editing is relatively easy. But you're probably here because you actually want to use the information. You want to make maps. You need them on your website. But this editing thing is still important. The reason is you can map what's of interest to your projects, your customers, your business, yourself. Or maybe someone's already done it and you can just consume that information. Okay, okay. Data model. We're cool with that now, but let's go straight into the maps. Don't worry. You shall have your maps. Um, I just want to point everyone quickly to um, a community website that we have. Uh, it's just switch to osm.org. Uh, this was created because a like a lot of open source projects, the documentation for OpenStreetMap was sort of all over the place. Your answer was somewhere, but it was probably in a wiki somewhere where maybe it's not well formatted, maybe the title of the page is, didn't really make sense. So this was designed to distill it down into, you want to do this, these are the st steps. Okay, got a lot of good resources there, but let's actually get some maps on your website. And that can probably mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, the first one is probably map tiles. Um, so map tiles are just a, a collection of images. Um, when you use something like Bing Maps or Google Maps and you drag around and the images load so that you can you know, keep following the map, those are map tiles. They can be styled in a bunch of different ways. Um, but other than that, it's a fairly standard thing. There's two major JavaScript libraries you can use for this. Um, the first one I'm going to go over is a um, little bit old, uh, the, the older, more established one. It was started about six or seven years ago. And one of the reasons a lot of people use it is it's integrated with a variety of other geo projects. So if you're heavily into geography and mapping and analysis, you would probably want to use this because there's a whole open source stack behind it. Um, it has a ton of features, um, having been going on for six years, a uh, large community. Um, so similar to the Apache Foundation, in uh, geo and mapping related projects, there's the Open Source Geospatial Foundation as well. And this is one of the OS geo projects. Um, the other thing is it has decent Internet Explorer support. Um, and if, if uh, cross-browser compatibility is important to you, it might be something to keep in mind. So the second one is Leaflet. I didn't really make, mean to make the uh, list smaller, but uh, basically it's a newer project. It's simple and easier to get started. Uh, it's just prettier out of the box. Open layers you can fully customize, but let's say you have a map and put a push pin on it. The default one is really ugly. Um, the library is a lot more uh, stable, and it actually has a sizable developer community as well. If you look at uh, commits to the proje both projects over the past year, they both have about 85 to 95 different developers have committed. So they're not small open source projects. So are there others in this fight? There are. There's a project called Modest Maps, and there's another one called Polymaps. I'm not sure how much development on Polymaps has been going on. It was a project started by uh, Simple Geo, which is sort of dissolved. It was a San Francisco startup. So let's see. Let's do a breakdown if you can't decide. Um, 
pretty simple. If Internet Explorer is key, you probably want to go open layers. If bandwidth is key, Leaflet is a lot smaller. Um, some of that is just open layers has built on so many features over the past six years. Um, and you can pull some features out, but you still end up with a much larger library. Um, open layers, you, let's say you need a specific feature. WMST support. What's that? Basically, it's a standard governments like to adopt a lot. So if it's checking off those standards boxes is important to you, you might want to get involved with that. Leaflet, just want that map on your website. Open Layers is a little, is, is more mature, but Leaflet has a more modern API because it's been built in the past two years. So I'm actually good friends with one of the two original Open Layers developers, and I asked him to check down my list. And he goes, yeah, that's all right, but I would probably just tell people to use Leaflet. So <laughs> um, it's, it's just, um, it's sort of replacing Open Layers as the more common thing. Okay, so you have the front end. But then there's um, the whole stack. So over on the right, you have the users actually browsing to your website, probably using Leaflet or Open Layers. Um, maybe you're building your own map tiles. And then there's the raw OpenStreetMap data. So um, in looking at these tiles, uh, you can see there's many options for styling. So Especially if design is really important, you have a lot of different options. Uh, this project was an April Fool's joke one year with an open street map that you could just randomly use whatever map styles that you wanted. But there's also a lot of beautiful map styles as well. Um, there's one specifically for cycling called Open Cycle Map. And what that does is you're not going to ride your bike down the highway. So if you think about normal online web maps, the highways are highlighted very brightly because it's primarily aimed at cars. Here, they're more subdued and in the background, but the side streets are really brought out. Um, and, and then you can take this to a whole nother level and be more artistic. Um, the one uh, second from the bottom is actually a watercolor map, uh, Stamen Design made. So it's meant to look like actually a hand-painted map. So you can do many, many different things. And then below that's another stamen design where they were looking for just a black, something that would print well in black and white, and then you could write on top of. So um, to have these custom maps, you can host them yourself. There's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, one is called Tile Drawer, and it's uh, relatively simple. You basically go pick the location that you want to host map information for, from. Um, you pick a map style, or you make your own, and then you can just launch an EC2. You have your Amazon credentials, and you're good to go. The second one that I think um, that my team uses, and we are teaching in Indonesia, is called Tile Mill. Uh, Tile Mill is actually the graphic design studio. So you can, this is actually the editing environment. So you can see it's a rather um, CSS-like uh, description on the right-hand side, and then on the left hand, you get your map of what exactly you're designing. Um, the, the actual language is called Cardo, and it's meant to be based very similar to CSS. Um, and then with Tile Mill, you can take these styles, and you can host them on your own server. You can pay the guys at Mapbox to host them as well, which is actually what Foursquare does. Um, you have quite a bit of different options. So then there's actually a couple more features I would think that you'd be interested in for maps on your uh, website, or functionality, rather. One is called uh, geocoding, um, which is uh, where you put in an address or an intersection or just the name of a town, and you get a latitude and longitude back. So this is a little bit different than just pictures, but if someone wants to look up an address on your website, um, you have to have geocoding. Otherwise, um, you just have a typical map that they have to go look around and find what they're looking for. Um, so that's also available. And also routing. Um, how to get from point A to point B. This is my route to the Jakarta airport. And uh, it took about six hours on um, Wednesday instead of three or four. And uh, why I missed my flight. Um, anyway, um, so OSRM uh, is an open source routing engine. Um, they have a sample API there, which 
It's free to use. Um, the only request is you don't run a bunch of calculations against it to try to find uh, like drive times to say what, how far can I drive in an hour. It's more requests like I want to go from point A to point B. Those are all fine. If you want to do more intensive requests, you can always host that as well. So, um, and one of the um, other things that might be of importance to you to have maps on your website would be custom editing. Because before I was saying, well, maybe people have already edited things you want, but maybe you're doing something very specific, like you want to create a custom cycling map. Well, this is the default editor if you hit edit on openstreetmap.org. The thing is, it gives you a ton of things to, to map, but maybe you just want to map, uh, as I said, bicycling, uh, uh, things of interest to cyclists, or maybe you're interested in, in green mapping and you want to map recycling, or you're interested in hiking. So this can all be reskinned so that you and hosted on your own site so that you can have a very focused uh, approach for your community or your project. Um, and uh, and Open Cycle Map is an, is an example, one of the sites that does that, for example. Now this is all Flash, and uh, I'm at a JavaScript conference, but we are, uh, the goal is to move over to a JavaScript editor. This has just started recently in the past six months. Um, the code is on GitHub. Um, there's a couple different groups working on it. The uh, Knight Foundation recently gave a half a million dollar grant to an organization called Development Seed to improve OpenStreetMap contributing, so they're spending a lot of time on this. And, um, and uh, as well as actually the developer that originally did the Flash application. Um, so um, I feel like, uh, so I personally moved from doing sort of commercial applications and the startup lifestyle to doing this do-gooder approach to OpenStreetMap. So I wanted to go into to just a couple examples of projects that are using this data for good. Um, if you have commercial interests, that's of course cool as well, and you can see how these could be, these techniques could be applied to different types of applications as well. So the first one is called wheelmap.org, and what this is, is it takes regular OpenStreetMap data and it allows you to mark the wheelchair accessibility of a location. Um, and so if you think about other maps where you don't have access to the data, you don't have the ability to extend things in this way. So it's relatively s simple. You can, just, you can say whether or not the entry has stairs, or if it has one or two, or you just don't know. And um, then they provide applications where people can use this data. But the thing is, anyone can use it as well. It doesn't have to be specifically for their application. Um, another example, um, this is actually in Haiti. Um, so what a tap tap is, is it's the informal bus system there. Um, and, and it's really semi-informal. There's stops, they go somewhere. But you have to ask someone, um, and, or just know. So um, a group of people wrote all the stops and, and recorded that information so that it can now be available. So you could see how in other places you might be able to take this and build routing applications um, on top of the data as well. Um, actually in Portland, Oregon in the United States, um, what they've been doing is combining government data with OpenStreetMap data and then using a software called Open Trip Planner. So they have a completely open stack in order to uh, do multimodal routing, which means, okay, I, have a, I can walk, I can bike, I can take the bus. What combination do I need to get to where I'm interested in going? And um, so finally, this is actually what I work on um, for my day job. So what I do is um, we're working with the government of Indonesia to help collect information in OpenStreetMap to better plan for disasters. So what this is, is we have a website where we call it our tasking manager. It allows people to take a grid square, 
and go edit data in that square. Um, so the city of Padang uh, had a big earthquake last in 2009, and it's one of the most at-risk cities in Indonesia for tsunami. Um, because what you can't see is over this way, there is a giant fault. Um, so anyway, we uh, collect building information by asking volunteers from all over the world to take that satellite imagery and trace over it, but also then work with people locally to collect more uh, robust information. And so what that feeds into then is actual models. So um, this is all that data that we collected in a software called Quantum GIS. And what it does is it takes that, open, that data we collected through OpenStreetMap and combines it with a scientific model for earthquake, combines it together and says how many buildings would uh, be damaged if an earthquake did happen of a certain magnitude. And um, how many would have no damage, low damage, significant. And this allows the government to better plan in case an earthquake does happen. And there's models for flooding and volcano and tsunami as well. So we, uh, we've been teaching all over um, people how to collect this information. Um, if you do happen to live in Jakarta, uh, we're going to be starting uh, to have open workshops on how to use OpenStreetMap data and collect it uh, in partnership with Wikimedia Indonesia. Um, the best way to keep an eye on that is um, on Facebook. We have a Communitas OpenStreetMap Indonesia, and that's where we typically announce things um, to the group there. So um, I actually did want to leave a bit of t time for questions, so that's actually my breakdown of things. Um, and uh, this is also how one can reach me, um, kate at hotawesome.org, and I'm also wonderchook on Twitter. All right, awesome. Let's hear it for Kate. <laughs> we got a full room here. Uh, questions? There must be questions. <laughs> I can, I don't I can know. just start, start showing websites too. <laughs> uh, are you seeing an uptick in actual contributions back from people who are like helping to monetize their products on top of this recently in, in light of recent events? Definitely. Um, Foursquare is a good example. Um, so they've hosted. Uh, in their New York office, mapping parties, um, and they, and what a mapping party is is just what it sounds like. Let's get together and teach people how to make the map better, um, help people with questions, things like that. Uh, Stamen Design, who made the watercolor map, has uh, open office hours in San Francisco for people who have open street map problems. Um, Mapbox, that um, they make the cartographic editor. Um, they actually have people sit down and trace areas. Since they have, the, since Foursquare is their customer, um, when they switched over, their OpenStreetMap coverage isn't 100% all over the world. So there are places where people are like, well, my neighborhood's gone. Well, that's great. Thanks, Foursquare. So what they did is they had people actually go, um, using satellite information, trace the data, and then try to find people locally who are interested in adding the roads. So there are some people who started out as the biggest critic, who now are actively contributing to OpenStreetMap through that support. All right, I, thanks for the talk, first of all. Um, got a question regarding the coverage as well. Which parts in the world are best covered? Is it just like those regions you talked about or um, how's the roadmap as well? Or, um, um, so it really, it really does vary by country. Um, I would say Germany is the best covered uh, country in the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, Scobler is a, is a company that makes routing software um, for iPhone and I believe Android. And so in Germany, that application is the number one map application in the iTunes store. Um, coverage in the United States is merely okay. Um, and uh, it's slowly getting better, but some of it is also, you compare the size of the United States to Europe, for example, it's taken some time. Um, but there is a base road network there because the U.S. government releases their uh, 
um, that data public domain, so it was imported originally. Uh, and I, I would say the places where the data tends to be better is places where there's uh, um, people have more free time, if that makes sense, or there's a better OpenStreetMap community. So if you go look at OpenStreetMap co uh, coverage in uh, parts of Africa, maybe it's not that great. Um, in Asia, it really varies. Um, there's a lot better coverage in Japan, for example. There's a pretty active community there. Um, it also depends on is there data people could start with, or are they starting with a completely blank map? Okay, good question. Hi, uh, is it possible to combine uh, like a, a, a map and the floor plans of particular building? Um, it is possible. Uh, there are some projects to do do indoor mapping using OpenStreetMap. Um, so some of it's in the very early stages because if you like, if you look at a lot of what we do with this data, it tends to be two dimensional. So then the editors are very aimed at, okay, I'm mapping in one dimension. So let's say you have a high rise, um, but if you had the data, you could combine it. Um, it is possible to map it in OpenStreetMap, but it might be a little bit complicated at the moment. Uh, I think what a lot of people don't know is that there's, on the commercial side of mapping, it's actually big business, right? There's a lot of money in it. And, and you guys can, could you maybe take a few minutes just explain how companies actually make mm -hmm. a lot of money off of mapping? Yeah, so I've worked for said companies back, before, back in the day. Um, so, uh, companies sell subscriptions to their map data. Um, two of the biggest used to be Teleatlas Tele and Navtech. Um, one was bought by Nokia, the other was bought by TomTom, Tom, basically to reduce their overall mapping costs. Um, and they do, they send people out to go collect data, basically. Um, Google used to use that data and then moved to using their own. Um, and I think you can see that as companies either purchase companies or start doing their own mapping, that's a cost saving, um, there's cost saving reasons for that. Um, and these commercial maps even, um, people put mistakes in them on purpose so they can determine people if people are basically stealing their data. Um, and, and that's very typical. And what these mistakes are is usually like a small cul-de-sac or something like that where um, um, one doesn't really exist. Okay. <laughs> uh, just uh, curious, how do you handle or secret objects? Like, uh, do you have uh, some instructions from the government to hide some particular areas? <laughs> we don't. Um, so uh, there are governments that would want to do that. Um, for example, in Pakistan, just this week, the national mapping agency there, it was announced that everyone was going to have to register with them in order to do mapping. Um, and uh, people doing OpenStreetMap there have stopped for the moment to try to figure out what to do. Uh, another example is technically in Russia, it's illegal to map military bases. So there's not quite agreement between members of the Russian community of what to do. Um, the servers are not based in Russia, so there's not really anything the government can do about it per se, but if you're someone that lives in a country where whatever you're doing is illegal, you might want to think twice about it. Um, but people obviously are going ahead and mapping. Uh, GPSs are illegal in Cuba, for example, but the map is pretty detailed there and there isn't a lot of satellite information people could use. So people are doing it somehow. Um, I suppose with the servers based in the UK, if there's something specifically there, um, maybe there would be some sort of legal recourse. But one thing I would say is the data is uh, replicated every minute. So if someone did say, I want you to take that data out, it's too late, it's all over the world. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. All right, great talk. Thank <laughs> you very much. Kate Chapman. <laughs>